Uh, okay, everybody, this is about to start. Um, so we're just going to say a few words of um, welcoming. Well, obviously, uh, thank you very much to everybody for being here. It's really great to, um, to have you all here. And we've got um, people from lots of different universities, which is really nice. I think we've got people from um, Brunel, from, well, obviously, Kent University, from LSE, from UCL, from... We're going to have people from um, East University of East London, East Anglia, and sorry if I'm missing any universities, but thank you all for being here. Um, so, um, also what's really cool about this, this event is that although we kind of created the platform for it to happen, um, the, the, the form that it's taken is really um, the form that all of the content and the input that you've all put in is giving the form to it, yeah. Um, and so, basically what I'm trying to say by that is that this event really belongs to everybody who's in this room and putting something into it. So well done, everybody. Um, and yeah. um, so we haven't organised an event of this nature before. So it's not exactly the perfect model, and um, it's a lot of we're a learning process as it's been going along. As Gabrielle said, we've got a lot of people putting stuff into it, so we don't actually know what will come out of it. Um, and we're just welcoming you all to fully participate in in questioning what's going on. We've, um, Gabrielle will explain the structure in a little bit, so there will be sort of a lot of uh, time for questions, and don't don't be shy. Basically, we want you all to sort of like get fully involved in, in, in the day. Um, I think one of the really important things about this event is that um, it's mainly undergraduates, um, and I think that undergraduates are really good at being wrong and at accepting criticism. So we should really use that to make sure that the energy in this room is an energy of like discussion and debate. Um, in a kind of positive way. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, so the, the way it's going to run is that um, most of the time we're going to have uh, three people speaking, or more, or more, but like three slots of 15 minutes, and then a 15 minute question and answer at the end of the three talks. So if you can try to keep all of your, all of your questions in the last 15 minutes, that would be cool. Um, following the event, we will be writing a summary of, sort of how we plan the event, and there's still boards and comments boards outside, so we will be taking that into account, and hopefully we can learn from this if people want to put this sort of event on in the future. The um, that, that, well, discussions that have started today will be continuing online in the, on the Open Anthropology Cooperative website, so after we will be able to follow this on, it's not just this event and it's over, we want to continue it after. And um, yeah, if you have any questions during the day, you can ask people with uh, red badges and try to switch your phones off. And if you come in in the middle, well, try not to make lots of noise. And <coughs> feel free not to stay, like, because this is probably going to be quite an intense day. So if you feel like your concentration is going away, feel free to go outside, but try not to make, like, to, uh, not to do that in the middle of a session or whatever. Yeah. Okay, and cool. thank you again. For yeah, coming. thank you very much, and we hope you'll enjoy it. Good morning and, and, and welcome to the first national undergraduate uh, conference for undergraduates in anthropology. My name is David Shankland, I'm the director of the Royal Anthropological Institute. It's a great, a great, great privilege. And um, our involvement in this event is, is, is quite straightforward. But we received an email saying, could we help? <laughs> and, uh, we were delighted to be able to say yes. It, uh, an event such as this is very, very much uh, the sort of thing that we think the Institute should be doing. And it really could be the start of something very, very big. So that later on we'll say, as it were, we, we were there. And uh, I'd like to congratulate the organisers on their, on their initiative. The thing that immediately comes to mind is the European Association of Social Anthropologists. Now, in, in, for the next conference in Paris, they have literally hundreds of people who are beating down the doors, who have been refused entrance, who actually want to go. People have been accepted numbers, numbers something like 1,500, and they simply can't fit any more people in. But that started very small 20 years ago in Spain. And perhaps in 20 years' time, this will also be such a large conference, and I, I hope that it will be. Already, a university has, won, has, has volunteered to be the next um, uh, convener for this event, and I, I imagine that it will go forward. So you can already think about um, putting down your diaries a trip to Scotland. The University of St. Andrews has made an offer to host the second National Undergraduate of Anthropology Day of Anthropology. And uh, I'm sure that the, 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 the organizers here will pass on all the relevant uh, experience and the details 
to the counterparts of St. Andrews, then the transition will uh, take place smoothly. <coughs> but what is the Royal Anthropological Institute that it should want to, to take interest in this event? Well, it's a curious beast. It started in the 19th century and went through various reformulations. And then Coragi settled down at the beginning of the 20th century into something like the format that we know now. But it's entirely independent. It's an institute, perhaps unique in the world, which is uh, owned by anthropologists, run for anthropologists, and has absolutely no masters. In other words, we get no government money. We uh, have a, a board which is actually uh, it consists of fellow anthropologists, and we run ourselves. And it's open to all people who would like to join. So there is no difficulty whatsoever. It doesn't matter whether somebody is an academic, although most of our membership does have some connection with the university, but that's not necessary. They simply need to have an interest in anthropology. And there are uh, student fellowships, and then after one of the other students, they can just become a normal fellow. And we have Fellows of the institute have been fellows for, for more than 50 years. Quite remarkable. Who still come regularly to meetings. And they do say things like, I remember what we decided in 1969. This sort of thing is, it still can be said. But it's extremely uh, uh, important for the field that we have that type of continuity, that type of breadth, and that type of independence. So what do we do with this independence? Well, of course we could do more. We always want to do more. But what we do already is we organize very public, prominent lectures at the British Museum. And you can uh, come to those if you like. They're very, very welcome. They take place two or three times a year, and they're on the advertised on the events page on our website. The highlight of each of these cycles is the Huxley Lecture, where a very distinguished anthropologist, in effect, sums up their life's work with some, uh, uh, in, uh, some added insight, perhaps, uh, coming from this sunny uh, and afterwards, there's always a very nice drinks party. We've just had, for example, Bruce Capra giving the Huxley lecture in December last year. And in December this year, it'll be Alan McFarlane, who is also a very, very distinguished and important anthropologist. Some of you will have seen his uh, websites where he has interviews with other anthropologists, which are great fun to look at. Uh, you can find them, if you haven't looked at them already, on alanmcfarlane.com with other resources. So if you'd like to come to that lecture, please do. It's free. It takes place in the evening. All you have to do is please send an email to our uh, administrator saying that you'd like to come, because it will absolutely, definitely be overwhelmed. But if you start sending emails now, then you'll be able to this. As well as these very uh, public lectures, we also have specialist programs. Two of those in particular. One is in epigraphic film and the other one is in education. Now, ethnographic film is the result of the Anthropology Institute in about 1970, I think, maybe a little bit after, sitting down and saying, really, what can we do which could be really, really important for the field? And they came up, they came up with the idea that ethnographic film is something that no other institute or institution is supporting properly. And so they decided to do so. And now we have, a, a, quite literally, a, a famous ethnographic film committee which organizes an ethnographic film festival once every two years. And the next one is going to be in Edinburgh next year. So again, if you'd like to come to that, you're, you're very, very welcome. That's in the second week of June. And that should be absolutely marvelous. Now, that is a truly international festival. People all around the world, the very best ethnographic filmmakers, send in their entries. The committee look at them very, very carefully. And there's a huge plethora of different kinds of ethnographic film on display. And this, of course, is a, is a chance not just to, to, to look at a huge variety of ethnographic work, but also see what's happening from the point of view of cinema uh, and modern techniques in producing film, which is often uh, extraordinarily uh, interesting and insightful. And we have a uh, quite excellent film officer, Suzanne Halaka, who uh, looks after and guards this program quite brilliantly um, throughout the year. And we're very proud of that program. In parallel to that, we run an an education program. Now, the significance of the, of the education program is not just that it tries to keep an eye on, on what's happening with anthropology universities, and I should say, 
we are pretty clear that in spite of the difficulties which beset modern higher education, we think anthropology is still expanding. So you know, we can all be very, very happy about that. But besides this, it also, about 10 years ago, formed itself with a very clear idea that anthropology should be a subject which is taught in schools. It felt that the, the insights that you can get from anthropology should not be confined purely to the university. And they did so methodically, systematically, carefully, and with an extraordinarily uh, uh, um, um, insightful program. They got it accepted by an exam board, the AQA, and then they managed to get it through the various regulatory hoops that you need to start with A-level. And that group is an A-level now sponsored by the REI. is being taught in, I think, about 20 schools at the moment. And we hope very, very much that this A-level will expand quickly so that it's uh, going to be possible to find it all around the country so that people, even at school, will have the chance to read this fascinating and wonderful subject of ours. Interestingly, when the people who were organizing that A-level, which primarily consisted of previous director Hilary Callum and uh, Professor Brian Street uh, from uh, King's College London, they were very clear that they wouldn't make it an A-level only in social anthropology. They thought that the way that the discipline is changing and metamorphizing all around the world <coughs> made it increasingly artificial to try to have a, a purely social anthropological focus. And this fits in very well with the REI, because in fact, we do think that archaeology, biological anthropology, social anthropology can actually be pursued together in intellectually very fruitful ways. This idea was translated into the A-level, which far from being just as it were a watered down first year text of some sort, was actually created de novo for the anthropology A-level, and has important components on trying to understand the anthropology of the body, on globalization and project and various other things, all of which are informed by this very, very broad and, and Catholic view of the uh, uh, disciplinary uh, circumstances, if you like, of, of anthropology today. <coughs> and that A-level has been really very, very well received. And one of our great tasks in the future must be to make sure somehow that it moves from this small pilot project, of, uh, if you like, of 20 schools to be taught by uh, a couple of thousand schools. And uh, if you have any ideas or you're interested in anthropology education, our education officer, Mafisa Ferrer, will be delighted to hear from you. She um, uh, works full-time at the Institute. She's also quite excellent at her job. And it's very, very simple to contact her. You just write to education at the REI. You'll see the um, email on our site. That's probably enough for me. Perhaps I should just finally say that we have uh, a very extensive photo collection, archive collection. And if any of you want to be an intern at the REI, uh, we usually accept a half a dozen interns a year to, to work on the, on, on the archives and the photo collections. And uh, in the first instance, you should just write to our administrator, but she will pass on your request. And uh, that gives you a chance, if you wish to, to, to actually work physically with the archives or with the photographs. So it remains for me to congratulate the organizers of today, and I look forward to, to, to really a wonderful program. wave of anthropologists coming through uh, the academic system. Uh, I hope we all survive the next few years. Um, but basically, I'll start by saying I'm glad to see that there's a certain kind of acknowledgement of ritual, which means that you start a nice radical conference like this by putting a couple of old farts up in front of you to talk about institutions, etc. Et However, uh, I will briefly mention a couple of things about University of Kent. But I also want to start by, by saying, and I'll emphasize this throughout, how vitally important the group of students at Kent who formed Tribe and the Conservation Society and brought together this, this project of breaking bubbles is. And I'll, I'll tell you why I think that. And this involves telling you a little bit about the history of anthropology at Kent. Kent's had an anthropology <coughs> department really since the beginning of the university in, in 1965. <coughs> and it was originally a very much a social anthropology department, had some quite significant figures moving through it. Um, in 1979, in 1989, uh, the Durham Institute of Conservation and Ecology 
was formed at, at Kent as well as a separate uh, research center for various reasons, which I generally refer to as a sexless uh, shotgun marriage. The two were brought, brought together several years back. And this made for some very interesting problems, because one of the issues that came up was that the conservation people were in large part um, natural science people, very much locked into, I shouldn't use the word locked into, it has its own connotations, but very much, very much involved in a, in a much more positivistic kind of idea of knowledge and how knowledge and legitimation went about. They were brought together with an anthropology department, which certainly is its main core as social anthropology, was, as you all know, probably somewhat of an interpretative so social science leaning itself towards the humanities area. So there were some real issues there about how you bring together an interpretive social science and a too large to large natural science-based kind of project. And among the elder generation, uh, there were real problems about how one talks to each other. In the meantime, biological anthropology took off at Kent. We began to develop a biological anthropology program, very interesting one, uh, which again brought up all sorts of questions about what kind of presuppositions were going on among the disciplines, what kind of training one had for it, what kind of legitimacy enabled one to speak for those disciplines. So we began to have a, I used to say a bifurcated department, it became a trifurcated department between so social anthropology, biological anthropology, and their Dural Institute. We kept trying to work on this among staff, but not doing very well on it. And we suddenly, in the last couple of years, got a very lively <coughs> bunch of students who simply said, this is nonsense. What we really should be doing with the department is keeping the independence of the areas that work in it, but nonetheless beginning to bring people together around a larger project, which is to look at the relation of human sociality and its environment, which is, of course, a natural environment and an environment of living animals and living plants and the like. So much more of a kind of project of seeing a holistic sense of the human and the environment as a linked kind of project. And these students basically said, look, we can see this kind of thing coming about, but you guys are all caught in these bubbles of your own disciplinary kind of, kind of obsessions. And we plan to burst those bubbles. And Tribe and the Conservation Society have very much played a role in pointing out the elephant in the room, which is this question about the methodological and the assumptions behind our methodologies and how they separate <coughs> groups that should be working together. So you've all seen the elephant. The elephant has its own very interesting role, by the way, because once we moved it into the shared space of the Marlow building, we began fighting with our uh, architecture about it, and the elephant in the room began to be the elephant in the room between architecture and anthropology. So it has its potential to be opening up even wider spaces of working between disciplines. So to basically sum up, I'm delighted with Tribe, I'm delighted with the Conservation Society, but Tribe in particular for pulling together this conference, it does take place at Kent, and I do hope that the School of Anthropology and Conservation at Kent, because of the kind of fields, the diverse fields that it covers, and yet diverse fields that can be brought together in a larger project of how we as human beings live in a world that's very much at risk because of our own practices, because of changes that we've brought about in it, how we can work on that. I think you guys can carry this on. We have been forced in some ways, I hope most of us willingly, to take much greater cognizance of the question of how we work as human beings within a social and a natural environment to try to make a world that we can live in into the future. And you guys are the future, and I'm delighted you're here, and I want very much to thank everybody for coming, but particularly the organizers for pulling this together. Thank you very much.